Live, it's Timberwolf Night in America. This is the Vibe Live Network, and tonight more non-stop honking of the Cedar Park football horn. I'm the V of the T, voice of the Timberwolves, Brad Cohn, our fifth show of the season, 112th show overall since we began doing this from my living room back in 2012. We're live from Santa Catarina Mexican Restaurant on Cypress Creek Road, a few hundred yards west of Old 183. We'll be here until 9 o'clock, so come on over and join us. There's about 20 people in the house for the Timberwolves tonight. With me once again, the king of Laces Out, the former Whiteout, member of our 2010 district title team and regional finalist. His organ donation card also lists his personality. Roses, stop to smell him. Lifetime Timberwolf Josh Willard. Oh, it feels so good to be here, especially coming off that amazing comeback victory, the biggest comeback victory in Cedar Park history, so can't wait to hash it out tonight, and uh, man, just so excited coming off that big Timberwolf win. No kid. Josh Cargile is our quality assurance agent again tonight, closely and diligently monitoring the broadcast from the super-secret, high-tech, low-maintenance, ultra-modern, technically advanced, stealthily cloaked Vipe Studios, making sure that we don't sound like a bulldozer scraping its way up I-35. With us tonight, the Cedar Park offensive line and their coach, Bo Barksdale, will be having a fun conversation with them starting at about the top of the hour. This year's Booster Club sponsors Toyota of Cedar Park, HEB, Rudy's Barbecue, Mungia Real Estate, Army Ant Moving, our touchdown sponsor, TJ Lewis Real Estate, Alzer's Barbecue, Wafford uh, Bank, and this here, Santa Catarina Mexican Restaurant. And here's what's on the menu for tonight's show. Josh will do the state of the program update. We'll review the Georgetown game. Yeah, that'll be fun. Then we'll look at other scores of interest, including the other 11-5A teams. We'll take a trip through the wonderful world of Willard. Then a, at the top of the hour, a little after, we'll bring on the O-line. We'll take a look at the season stats now that they've started accumulating. Then we'll play a fun trivia game with the guys. And in closing, a preview of our next opponent, the Hendrickson Hawks. And now here's Josh with our whistling speaker and our state of the program update. Yes, so we're going to have a touchy speaker tonight for sure, but the all-time record for Cedar Park football is now 204-73. and 73. That's 131 games over 500, and they are now 107-46 and 46 away from home and a 78-32 and 32 as the visitor in opponent stadiums. The all-time record is now 106-31, and 31, and Cedar Park has never lost in Burkleback Stadium. 9-0 every time we go there. I'm just saying, I mean, just kind of – Paved the way. This yeah. is our stadium now, uh, but uh, <laughs> home away from home. That's exactly right. Uh, they led the all-time series with Georgetown now 14 and two, and have not lost to the Eagles since 2008. Shout out to my oldest brother, Dak Gummin. He is the last person to lose to Georgetown, uh -huh. and that's okay. We can hold that over his well, head. He didn't do it. That's okay. No, definitely not him as a tight end and Shane Alvey. It was not all them. Uh, the Timberwolves have now won 15 consecutive district games and 44 of their last 45 dating back to 2014. That's one of the most impressive stats about this program right now, I think. 44 of the last 45 district games. Right? And, that, and that last one this last week, that was a big one. If they yeah. could get past that one, that, that's a good sign. Uh, 2021 is the seventh year in a row the program has won its district opener since the Ross ascendancy began in 2005. The team is 14-3 and three in district openers, and two of those three losses are to Georgetown. Yeah, I don't know. why. Those are our only two losses ever to Georgetown. They beat us in district openers back-to-back -back years. That's some lightning out there. Yeah, it's diligent to tell you. But there's a uh, forecast for some rain. We are out on the porch here at Santa Catarina and under some slats that aren't fully covering us. And if we start getting water on this equipment, it will destroy it. So at the first sign of water, I'm sorry, we'll just have to quickly shut it down, and that'll be the end of the show. I, I hope we go for a ways before that happens, or maybe it doesn't happen at all. All right, a quick, a quick trivia question out of the gate, Josh. You mentioned we're 9-0 and at Burkle back all time. Not all of those wins have come over Georgetown. Who else have we beaten at Burkleback? We have definitely beat Maynard. Yes. And I'm not talking like it was the biggest hit in high school football history against our own Thomas Middleton on a kickoff return. Do you remember that hit? Oh. Oh. Yeah. How could you forget? Oh. So That's other it. than Maynard, we've definitely taken care of Eastview. I think that's it. 
There's one other. We've beaten Georgetown five times, Eastview three times, Maynard once in that 2020 or that 2012 state semifinal, Kerrville Tyvee once in the 2015 oh. regional semifinals. Oh. Interestingly, the two playoff wins we've had at Berkelbach both came during seasons in which we won the state championship, 12 and 15. We'd love to keep that trend we'll going. Keep that going. Okay, another one. You mentioned we're 14-3 and three in district openers since the Ross Ascendancy began in 05. We painfully remember one of those losses to open the 14 district campaign, 23 to nothing to a bad Dripping Springs team. Who were the other two district opening losses since the Ross Ascendancy? Okay. I'm trying to get my mic right. I'm saying Westwood, maybe. Can we get Westwood in the mix? Negatory. Oh, okay. So district district opening loss happened twice since the Ross ascendancy. Besides that Dripping Springs game, <laughs> didn't happen with my team. I can tell you that Did much. Not. Nope, didn't happen. It's Georgetown both times. What? The only two wins ever by them. The seven and eight games that we keep talking about. All right, here we go. The review of the Georgetown game. This will be fun. Pull up to the speaker and get yourself a nice beverage because here we go. Cedar Park had found themselves looking up from the wrong end of the unmentionable stat September 10th against Round Rock at the Gub down 14 to nothing halfway through the second quarter. It happened again even quicker Friday night in Georgetown going down to the Eagles 14 to nothing just before the end of the first quarter. And it would get worse before it got better because with 2.44 left in the half, after another touchdown, Georgetown would add insult to injury with a 15-yard TD pass off a fake field goal to push the margin at that point to 28-7. to But what started out so alarmingly badly turned into an absolutely amazing game. One for the ages. They write books about games like this. There were only four punts. Half of those in the first three minutes of the game. Over a 1,000 yards of total offense. A combined 53 first downs. 13 touchdowns. The team's highest point total of the year. The extension of a 15-game district winning streak. This here O-line, who our guest tonight allowed no sacks and paved the way for Cedar Park's best rushing night in four years as the Timberwolves kicked off the district campaign with a highlight reel victory that saw seven lead changes in the last 19 and a half minutes of the game. By the end of it all, Cedar Park posted a 49-45 win, coming back from that ugly 28-7 hole. The 21-point deficit erasure was the largest comeback in Cedar Park history, replacing a 20-point rally from a 27-7 halftime ditch in 2017 against, wait for it, Georgetown. That game had replaced the previous record 14-point comeback win in 2014 against, wait for it again, Georgetown. Man, how those guys must hate us. And as long as we're mentioning our greatest comebacks, let's slip in something about being down 14 on the road to San Angelo Central with just 53 seconds left in the game and winning in 2019, or being down 17-7 to Westlake in the 08 opener and winning 31-17. Never the wrong time to make mention of those two nights. Now, Cedar Park's become a program that is as difficult to kill as a cockroach. If you're up by multiple scores, there's a pretty good chance you've got us right where we want you. There was little defense allowed in this game. Cedar Park would end up with 528 yards of offense. Georgetown had 527 total of 1,055. After the two teams traded punts to open the game, the Eagles found their offense first and cruised 85 yards in 11 plays to go up 7 to nothing. Cedar Park started moving as well, but fumbled the ball away at the 40, and on the first play, a 41-yard touchdown strike for the Eagles, who went up 14 nothing with 28 seconds left in the first. That kicked the Cedar Park offense to life, and Josh Pell engineered a five-play, 75-yard touchdown march that ended with a 49-yard scoring pass to Cody Marshall, something that turned out to be just a warm-up for one of the greatest moments in Cedar Park football history about an hour and a half later. 
Rajon Barr's kick made it 14-7, just 31 seconds into the second quarter. Georgetown matched that with their own 75-yard scoring drive. This one in 10 plays, the score going to 21-7 with 7.26 left in the half. A rare three and out followed for Cedar Park, their only one of the night. Georgetown continued to move easily, going 48 yards and seven snaps, but getting stopped by the Black Rain at the 15. They lined up for a field goal, but one of their players lined up way out on the left side, almost at the boundary, his back facing the team set up for the field goal kick. At the snap, he whirled and streaked down the sideline of the end zone as the holder grabbed the snap, stood up, and fired a touchdown pass to him. Josh here dreams of that exact play every night. So what was going to be bad enough at 24-7 with the field goal was instead 28-7 with 2.44 left in the half. And none of us knew it at that moment, but over the next 11 minutes and 47 seconds on the game clock, the Timberwolves would outscore the Eagles 29-3 to jump feet first right back into this football game. Cedar Park would score touchdowns on every one of its next five possessions and six of its next seven. Their response to the fake field goal was a 63-yard drive in 10 plays, utilizing very deft clock management and burning only 1 minute and 58 seconds in those 10 plays. Kevin Adams took it in for the score from 7 yards out with 46, 46 seconds left in the half. PAT team got the look it wanted from the defense when they lined up in the swing and gate and went for two, Pell hitting Joseph Edwards for the score, so tit for tat. They'd fake to place kick and hit a scoring pass, and then we faked to place kick and hit a scoring pass. It was 28-15, Eagles, and that was the halftime score. Cedar Park had won the toss and deferred, something virtually everyone does now, but it's a tactic that we pioneered back in 2005. Prior to that, unless the wind was really strong, the universal approach was win the toss and receive. Want to know something else we pioneered? All black uniforms. No one was doing that when we first did it 21 years ago in 2000. By 2004, Austin Bowie had one. 2007, Lake Travis got one. 2008, Cibolo Steel started using one. These days, everybody has an all-black uniform. We were the first. Georgetown wore one Friday night, as a matter of fact. So anyway, the T-Wolves got the ball to open the second half, and a nice kickoff return by Marshall set the offense up at the Georgetown 48. Just four plays later, Pell hit Nick Gruyon, who was double-teamed all night for a touchdown from 26 yards out. Barr's kick was good just a minute and 14 seconds into the third. The Georgetown lead had shrunk from 28-7 to 28-22 in exactly two minutes on the game clock. And it was at this moment that the sort of cockwalk outward disposition that had been shown by Georgetown since early in the game started to disappear, likely replaced by an institutional realization that, oh crap, here we go again with Cedar Park. Their outward comportment visibly changed at this point in the game. They played with far less bravado the rest of the way. Their offense got one first down and punted. Cedar Park took over in their own 20, sliced and rumbled 80 yards in seven plays. The touchdown coming on a 10-yard run up the middle by Tyree Nicholson to tie the game at 28-all with 7.31 left in the third. Barr's kick busted that tie, and Cedar Park finally took the lead 29-28. But the Eagle offense built up steam again. Starting from their own 25, Cedar Park kickoffs were going through the end zone all night. That's where they almost always started. The Eagles went 69 yards in nine plays, but stalled at the six. This time, no fake field goal, but a real one. And Georgetown had retaken the lead 31-29 with 4.04 left in the third. It took Pell and company just a minute and seven seconds to take that lead back going 61 yards in four plays. Adams started it out with a monster 18-yard run in which virtually every Georgetown defender hit him at least once. He finally went down at the Georgetown 43 with five guys on his back. Two plays later, Pell screamed around the end and darted 31 yards to the one. From there, Adams ended the drive with a touchdown plunge, and Barr's kick made it 36-31 Cedar Park with 2.57 left in the third. But Georgetown responded with a large dose of their big quarterback, Darson Herman, 6'4 and 240 pounds. Let me tell you, if Ryder Hernandez had that size, he'd be quarterbacking Alabama right now. The Black Rain had begun to stymie most of the rest of their offense, but simple snaps to Herman with him racing off tackle were murder. The Eagles did that for most of the rest of the game, starting with this possession, where they went 75 yards and just six plays to score another touchdown, again retaking the lead 37-36, but failing to expand that lead to three on a stuffed two-point conversion run. They should have run Darson. 
They were now 35 seconds left in the third. More great field position for Cedar Park as the short kickoff went out of bounds and the Timberwolves once again started at the Georgetown 48. After three plays, they appeared to be stopped, but on fourth and one, Tyree Nicholson shoved forward for the first down. Pell hit Gruyon for the second and final time of the night with a 29-yard strike to the one for a first and goal, but a penalty backed the Timberwolves up and the score eventually came on a 16-yard steamroller of a run by Kevin Adams, his third touchdown of the night. The numbers dictated another try for two here, leading 42-37, but the run failed. There was 11-15 left in the game. Georgetown then put up a long time consuming drive, trying to run the clock down to where Cedar Park wouldn't have much time left if the Eagles scored and took the lead again. They went from their own 15 to the Cedar Park 8, where they were stopped on fourth down with about two and a half minutes left on the clock. Cedar Park basically just needed two, maybe three first downs to clinch the game. They ran the ball exclusively here on a night where they ran very well indeed. They left the tempo game, wanting to burn clock between snaps. Adams and Pell traded carries, and they got that first first down. Adams was on a 13-yard burst up the middle, getting the second first down when tragedy struck. The ball was ripped from his hands, and the Eagles recovered it at the 39 with a short field ahead of them to win the game. It took just four plays to cover those 39 yards. Running back Devin Ross taking it in from four yards out with just 44 seconds left. Herman ran over the two-point conversion to make it 45-42 Eagles. Another nice kickoff return by Marshall started Cedar Park at their own 36. On the first play, Pell kept left but lost three yards. On second down, Pell hit Grant Nichols for 12 yards to the 46. It was third and one. And then came history. There have been a few terrific end-of-game passes in Cedar Park lore. Josh here was on hand for the 17-yard strike from Brian Hogan to Joseph Washington with 29 seconds left against Vista Ridge in 2010 and the subsequent two-point pass play to Michael Waterfield for a 39-38 win to keep an undefeated season and the program's first top-10 ranking alive. There was the stunning 65-yard pass and run from Travis Watson to Jamie Knight as time expired for a win over Pflugerville that kept Cedar Park undefeated at 7-0 in 2006 in front of the NBC television cameras. Now we can carve into the stone tablets the 54-yard strike from Josh Pell to Cody Marshall. All or nothing, AC Ducey, win it or lose it, with 13 seconds left against Georgetown. Marshall lined up as the forward receiver in a stack of two out on the right side and beat both of the DBs who were covering him with a dead sprint for the post from a perfect pocket formed by this here offensive line. Pell's throw was absolutely beautiful. Fell right into Cody's arms. The main thing was it's not to trip over a yard line or something or have a heart attack in those last 15 yards. The Cedar Park crowd went straight to insanity mode and so did your broadcast crew in the booth, by the way. Indeed. One for the ages. Georgetown ran an attempted hook and ladder play with a few seconds fate had afforded them. It went for just five yards. The game was over, and this Cedar Park team has just tucked an experience into their souls that they will be telling their kids, their grandkids, and their great-grandkids about forever. I'm so jealous of them. I don't have anything remotely like this to tell my grandkids about. The Timberwolves start their 12th district title offense, 1-0 in the league. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to hone in the speaker, but at the same time, we're just going to make sure we get the broadcast off. At the same time, I mean, that, that, that game was absolutely ridiculous, and to see the never-quit attitude from the Cedar Park team, it was so uh, just inspiring, because I'm not joking that everybody in the booth, when we were down 28-7, to no, nobody was kind of shaken. We were kind of like, okay, just take it one possession at a yeah, time. Yeah, what's going to happen next? Very Brady-esque, and that was what was so exciting about it was that we had an opportunity uh, to take it one possession at a time, and, and we could rely on the black rain, but then we got to give hats off, and we're going to give this offensive line their flowers tonight whenever they come over here uh, because they definitely changed something on a dime in their ability to score not only seven points but eight points right before half and then getting the ball that was just amazing to see that this offense was able to orchestrate that right before half and then get the ball and go right back and do the same dang thing 
so it was very inspiring to see this offense get together, uh, collectively find a way to get into the end zone from not only up close, because Kevin Adams had a lot of it you know, touchdown runs that he was able to punch in the end zone, but we were also able to take strikes from outside of the zone. Uh, so it was exciting to see this offense click, and then the black rain, oh my gosh, I mean, God bless us. We've been able to rely on the black rain for the past decade, and so that we're able to go ahead and just, you know, make them make a play. Yep, this is a bend but don't break nothing. And when we're up in the booth, I mean, we don't even think about it. We just think that that's all right. We're going to make the black rain. They're going to make a big play. And they made a huge goal line stand yeah. there at the end that gave Cedar Park a chance to, to give them some breathing room and give them an opportunity to kind of play the position game. But the, the black rain was bend but never break that entire game. They, that, there was over 1,000 yards in offense of this game, but it doesn't matter. The black rain made big plays when it mattered. It did. Look at some of the individual stats. Uh, uh, Kevin Adams ended with uh, 22 carries and 141 yards. One of the best nights of his career. A 6.4 average touchdown runs of 7, 1, and 16. Pell 9 for 108. Two guys ran for 100 yards behind this here offensive line. Tyree Nicholson, not bad. A 5.9 average on 8 carries for 47 yards and a touchdown run of 10 yards. Cody Marshall. Even got into the rushing stance with a carry for two yards. Pell, all the passing numbers, 13 for 19, uh, 230 yards, 68.42 completion percentage, 12.11 yards for attempt, three touchdown passes of 49, 26 and 54 yards. Hernandezian type numbers from Josh Pell. Uh, receiving uh, five different guys caught passes. Uh, Grant Nichols, one for 13, a very important one that set up. The last play of the game for the touchdown. Uh, Nick Gruyon rarely targeted because they had him bracketed all night long, but he caught two for 55, including a 26-yard touchdown catch. Kevin Adams had a catch for eight. They gained an important first down. Joseph Edwards, five important catches, many of them for first downs, 42 yards, an 8.4 average. And Cody Marshall, four catches, 112 yards, a 28-yard average, two touchdown catches of 49 and 54 yards. What a night for Cody. I've got to bring myself down because I, I, I need to be able to comfortably get off my remarks on Cody Marshall and his ability to just give relief to Josh Pell because he needs to focus on Josh Grulon because Grulon, excuse me, we had that pronunciation discussed here at Timberwolf Night in America. And for Nick to be triple coverage, double coverage all night, and for Josh to be able to beat his coverage, I mean, it looks like I saw some pictures posted on Twitter or Instagram of him playing receiver back in the day. It doesn't seem like this is anything he's not accustomed to, and especially on the defensive side last year on this state championship run that we had uh, for Cedar Park. He was a vital aspect on that defensive back as, as a safety. He was able to make big plays and make turnovers and high point the ball. So for him to be on the offensive side of the ball, it just gives Josh another weapon. Um, and, I, and I really think this is going to open up opportunities for Carter Well, uh, the sophomore receiver for us. I think he's going to be able to get open in the slot a lot more because of the attention that Cody Marshall and Nick Gruyon yeah. are going to be able to attend. And, and Grant Nichols, too. That's going to be a big target that I think Cedar Park is going to need to start forcing, a, you know, getting some opportunities, too. So it's going to be – it's really exciting how this season goes on because that, that that game, I mean, we got back on pace with Cedar Park stats. I mean, in I two, so. two 100-yard rushers, I don't know the last time that happened. We'll get to that. Oh, here's the score wait, by quarters. <laughs> here's the score by quarters. Uh, we lost the first quarter 14 to nothing. That's the only one we lost. I know we won at the end, but the second quarter? 15 to 14. The third, 21 to 9. The fourth, 13 to 8. We outscored them in every quarter but the first. Now, I keep the school records, too. Here are the observations I gave Coach Q while updating the school record book. The win keeps alive a 15-game district winning streak that stretches back to 2018. Cedar Park's now gone 13 years since their last loss to Georgetown in 2008. Leading the series 14 wins to two, winning nine in a row from them now. The comeback to victory from a 21-point deficit is the largest Cedar Park comeback in program history. The previous largest comeback, 20 points in 17, also against Georgetown. Josh Pell's 338 yards of total offense, 24th most in program history. And again, 
we played 277 football games, and there's eight or ten guys piling off total offense stats in every game. So out of about 2,700 entries, his performance was the 24th most. So keep that in mind. With his next four passing yards, we'll have to keep track of this this week, Pell will reach 1,000 for his career, joining 13 other Cedar Park quarterbacks who have done so. At the moment, with an average of 220 passing yards per game this season, Pell is tied with Max Sexton's 2017 average for third best in school history. Mackie. Kevin Adams, 141 rushing yards, pushes him past Ethan Fry and Thomas Hutchings into 12 on the all-time rushing list at Cedar Park with 1,234. Mick Fry. Mick Fry. Tyree Nicholson's 11-yard scoring run was his first career touchdown. He becomes the 96th player ever to score a rushing touchdown at Cedar Park. Nick Gruyon's 57 yards receiving allows him to pass Michael Waterfield, Jerry Hunt, and Travis Smith to climb to 30th on the list of most career catches at Cedar Park. It was his fourth game, and he's already at 30th on the list of most career catches. Gruyon's yardage in this game also allowed him to rise from 29th to 22nd on the list of single-season receiving yardage at Cedar Park. Passing performances by Chris Shedler, Trevor Mugato, Jack Grimm, the Grim Reaper. Sam Brock, Patrick Anthony, Brandon Breed, Carlos Woolery, who caught the last completed pass ever thrown by Max Sexton, by the way, and Hayden Craig, who plays baseball for Southwestern now. Cody Marshall's 112 receiving yards were 34th best in one game in Cedar Park history. Actually, I think I had that in there already. Marshall's 54-yard touchdown catch to win the game was the 24th longest passing play in Cedar Park history and the longest ever in the last five minutes of a game. Marshall's 49-yard touchdown catch earlier in the game was his first career touchdown catch, but not his first career scoring catch. He caught a two-point conversion last year. With his later 54-yard game-winning touchdown catch, Marshall becomes the first Cedar Park player ever who had multiple touchdown catches on the night he made his first career touchdown catch. He becomes the 84th Cedar Park player to catch a touchdown pass in school history. With his three scoring runs, Kevin Adams now has 20 career touchdowns, 17 rushing, three receiving, for 15th on the all-time list at Cedar Park and climbing quickly. Only 21 times in 277 games, Cedar Park scored more offensive touchdowns than the seven scored against Georgetown. So, top 10 percentile in this game. The 528 yards of total team offense was the 25th best in program history. Again, top 10 percentile. The 329 yards of second half total offense were the 25th most in one half in Cedar Park history. The team total of 298 rushing yards against Georgetown is the most in five years since getting 325 against Manvel in a 2016 playoff loss. The 527 yards of total offense allowed Georgetown, unfortunately, the most ever in a victory and the fifth most ever allowed overall. The 283 rushing yards given up against Georgetown are the 14th most in one game at Cedar Park. The combined 556 rushing yards allowed in the two most recent games are second most in school history, but a long way behind the most. 860 given up in consecutive games to Leander and Pflugerville in 2003. The 151 rushing yards by Darson Herman, the 17th most ever against the Cedar Park defense, the second most ever against Cedar Park by a quarterback to Lorenzo Joe's 165 for Abilene Cooper in 2013. He is right. That's a, we need to get a trivia question. Yeah, there we go. We get a free, a free uh, trivia point for that one. The win improved the program's record in games in which they've allowed 40 points or more to 4-14. Four and 14. We don't do well when we allow 40. The seven second half lead changes are the most ever in any Cedar Park half or game. Kevin Adams rushed for 141, Josh Pell for 108. This was the first time two Cedar Park players had more than 100 yards rushing each since Thomas Hutchings and Amir Alzer had 110 and 138 respectively against Vista Ridge in a 49-21 win November 7, 2014, seven years ago. Since tracking this stat, beginning with the 2005 season, this is the first time since 2017, also against Georgetown, that Cedar Park trailed going into the fourth quarter and still won the game. The team's now 7-34 and since 2004 in games when they've trailed going into the fourth quarter. We also trailed at halftime against Georgetown, making the program now 14-32 and since 2004 in games during which they trailed at the half. What do you think?
Okay, I mean, I'm going to have to turn it down just so I can get my thoughts off. That was incredible performance by our Cedar Park team. We're starting to get some rain trickles. I don't know how you want to proceed, Mr. Cone. Um, we'll go it's ahead and get not you. not bad enough yet. I'm just feeling a little dry Not bad enough there. yet. I not like that attitude. Uh, but at the same time, still, the Cedar Park Timberwolves came out. They played really hard. And the fact that they never gave up when they were down 21 points halfway through the second quarter, it was just a collective effort to go ahead and get through that ball game. And not only only getting it done through the air they were able to establish a run game and get Kevin Adams going Tyree Nicholson as well so it was so happy to get these trench dogs here in the house tonight because they definitely earned their stripes in getting their boy into the end zone and unfortunately we are gonna have to shut down the rain is starting to come so let me give the uh, the outro here unfortunately that's it for our fifth episode Friday night is the home district opener at the Guff against Hendrickson a 15-game district winning streak on the line, as well as a 31-game home district winning streak. Kickoff at 7, pregame show at 6.45. I'll be on the stadium, Mike. It might be raining then, too. Josh will have the play-by-play. -play. Cecil with technical production, additional commentary. Thanks to our guests tonight who we didn't get to get on, and their coach, Bo Barksdale. we got to get them on Dick next week. we gotta, we got to gotta Maybe we can push the guests back a week. I mean, yeah. we're going to get to the playoffs, right? Come on now. We we're going to have the receivers next week. We'll push them back. For our QA, Josh Cargill, my own personal Chris Collinsworth, Josh Willard, Brad Cohn signing off. You've been listening to a shortened Timberwolf Night in America on the Vibe Live Network. See ya.